Thank you, Jeffina. Uh, I was happily talking with the mic muted. Okay. So let me begin again. Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, before we went for the break, we were looking at um, Genesis chapter 3, verses uh, uh, 14 and uh, 15. Um, and we said that uh, this verse is referred to as the Proto-Evangel, uh, which means it's the first, um, uh, you know, it's the first um, evangelistic message. Uh, it's the first messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. And it's also referred to as the Edenic uh, covenant. And this covenant is the basis um, for the development of all the other covenants on redemption. Uh, we also um, said that this was, you know, in one sense, it's in a figurative um, sense. Um, um, okay, that means, uh, you know, and we saw and we looked at um, what each um, word and who it represents. Um, and we ended by talking about uh, the word head, which in um, Hebrew is um, rosh, which means, uh, you know, somebody who's supreme, who's prince, who's a leader, who is a chief, and it's basically referring to uh, Satan, okay? Now, some important facts that we need to, um, uh, you know, uh, look at or learn from these, uh, this verse is that the enmity between Satan and the human race um, you know, there is an there, uh, there began an enmity between Satan and the human race, um, and uh, it implies that uh, you know uh, God would one day reconcile uh, the world to Himself, and we know that this was made possible. This was accomplished uh, through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So. That is one important fact that we learn from this verse. The second thing is that, um, that the seed of the woman uh, will crush the head of the serpent, which is Satan. Uh, and we know that this has been literally fulfilled uh, in Christ. Uh, we read this in Hebrews chapter 2, verses um, 14 and 18, uh, where it says, the last part of verse 18, where, where it says, through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so here we see that, um, you know, uh, that Jesus Christ destroyed um, Satan uh, and destroyed his power and destroyed the power of death uh, and he destroyed Satan on the cross. Okay, and this we also see that this promise is being fulfilled. We read about this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, where um, this promise of, um, uh, you know, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent uh, is being fulfilled through the people of God. Uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Uh, can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Hello, is anyone in class? Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Yes, Subhashish, can you please read then Romans chapter 16, verse 20? Um, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush that and under your feet the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Okay, so here we see that, uh, you know, um, that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. That's talking about, uh, here basically it's talking about, um, uh, you know, Paul writing to the church at um, Rome. And he says that even as the Romans, the, the church at Rome, will stand on guard against those who are, uh, uh, you know, bringing in false teachings, um, uh, you know, trying to divide the church, those who are trying to deceive the people of God, uh, they will see God crush Satan 
under their feet. That means they will see God, uh, you know, uh, bring an end to those uh, who are deceiving the church, who are trying to divide the uh, church. So here we see that, um, uh, you know, uh, crushing Satan under your feet was already an accomplished thing uh, by Jesus when he did it on the cross. Uh, and how do we know this? We read it in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. And we also see that it's being fulfilled in the people of God, uh, as we read in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And last important point or fact that we need to um, understand or uh, that we can learn from this verse is the serpent was to bruise his heel, which portrays you know, the prolonged struggle between good and evil. So there'll be a long struggle. Satan will continue to, um, uh, you know, uh, deceive us, continue to cause harm and difficulty. So it's going to be a continuous struggle between good and evil. Okay. So we looked at the first Old Testament prophecy that is given in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, and 15, which is the Edenic covenant, uh, the coming of the Messiah who will uh, destroy Satan uh, through his works. And we see that it's fulfilled. Uh, before we look at the second uh, Old Testament prophecy, sorry, uh, that's the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the promise to Abraham. Anyone has any doubts? No? Okay, then we go ahead and look at the Abrahamic covenant, the promise to Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Can somebody read that, please? Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the heart shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Okay. Okay. So, uh, this is part of God's covenant to Abraham. And God is promising Abraham that through his seed, that means through his des descendants, his children's children, the generations to come, that all nations on the earth will be blessed. So all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's seed, that is his children's children, the generations to come. And we see Paul writing about this as well in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 18. Uh, sorry, Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 16. So can somebody read Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 16, please? Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 16. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would just justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, <laughs> saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Amen. Okay, thank you. So here, um, uh, you know, Paul is mentioning about um, the promise that uh, God made, the covenant that God made. And here we see his seed indicates that God was speaking about uh, Christ uh, the American Standard Version reads as this, In thy seed shall all the nations bless themselves. i say that again. In thy seed shall all the nations bless themselves. So this implies that all the nations, you know, should seek Jesus Christ. And when they seek Christ, you know, uh, they will receive blessings or they will be blessed and this blessing will come only through uh, Jesus Christ. So we know that all nations don't seek him, okay? And hence there is a need for us to, you know, proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus, of his salvation, of his work uh, among all the nations, okay? So through uh, the seed that God is talking about here to Abraham's seed is basically referring to, uh, Jesus, who comes in the lineage of um, Abraham, and uh, through Jesus Christ, uh, you know, the, the blessings will be released 
through uh, to all nations, to people in all nations. And we see that all nations uh, do not believe in Jesus Christ and hence the need for us to share so that they could receive the blessings that come uh, through the covenant promise that was made by God to Abraham, that through his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So through Jesus, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Okay. The next Old Testament prophecy about uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ is in Genesis chapter 49, uh, verse 10. So can somebody read that, please? Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Genesis 49, 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Okay. Thank you. So here this prophecy is clearly talking about a foretelling about uh, uh, one particular individual and that is talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, the word Shiloh here uh, is, uh, or Shiloh is, um, uh, you know, a, a city in which the tabernacle was set up. We read this in Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. The city was later destroyed. We read about this in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Um now, the Jewish scholars explain that this word Shiloh or Shiloh is compounded from two words, Shell and Lo, uh, which means to whom it belongs. Okay, so Shiloh basically means to whom it belongs. Uh, as I said, uh, Shiloh was a city, um, but here it's basically referring to a person that is Jesus Christ. So the scepter will not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, which is talking about Jesus Christ coming. Uh, and the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Uh, and um, we know that Jesus came uh, out of the royal tribe of Judah. We read this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Um, and we also see in this uh, prophecy, which is talking about a foretelling about uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, it's also foretelling about the second coming of Jesus Christ, the latter, latter half of this verse in, in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, where it says, and to him shall the obedience of the people be. Okay, so one version says, as unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Another version says, and the nations will obey him. That means when Jesus comes again the second time, he will gather all people from every nation to himself. And we know that during the thousand year millennium rule, all nations would live together uh, and, uh, you know, they would obey Jesus Christ. So here it's the two prophecies, one about um, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that the scepter will come, the ruler will come uh, from uh, Judah, and we see that it's fulfilled. Um, and also, you know, uh, Shiloh, which is uh, meaning a place, but here it's referring to a person, uh, because the scepter will come to whom it belongs, and that is Jesus Christ, okay? Um, and so we see that this prophecy is fulfilled because Jesus came in the lineage or the tribe of um, Judah. Okay. The next Old Testament uh, prophecy about the incarnation of Christ we read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 and verse 18. Can somebody read that, please? Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 and 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Okay. Thank you, Roslyn. Uh, here we see that, uh, you know, um, the prophet that has been spoken about here is um, Jesus Christ. And how do we know that this is Jesus Christ? Uh, because Peter quotes this passage in his sermon in Acts chapter 3, verses 20 to 26. Um, and he reveals to us that this prophet is referred to uh, Christ himself. 
And we also see that, uh, you know, John the Baptist, when he is testifying, if Jesus is the Messiah, uh, uh, we read this in John chapter 3, he, and when people were looking for the Messiah and they were wondering if Jesus was the Messiah that they were looking for, uh, he, uh, John the Baptist confirms this when he says in John chapter 3, verse 34, for the one whom God has sent speaks the very words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. So he says he's proving that Jesus is the prophet, the Messiah they were looking for. And uh, how is he the Messiah? Uh, John is saying that, you know, he speaks the very words of uh, God. And in Jesus, we see the spirit uh, without any measure, limitless. Okay, and thus proving that Jesus is the Messiah and telling the people, this is the Messiah you were looking for. Uh, this is a prophet that was spoken about in, uh, in the Old Testament. And hence, we know that this prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18, where God is uh, promising that he will raise a prophet, uh, that he will put his words in his mouth as referring to um, Jesus Christ. Okay, before we move on to the next prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and Isaiah 9, verse 6, uh, anyone has any questions or doubts so far? No, ma'am. Okay, if, okay, thank you. If no, then we will move on. Can somebody read, somebody who's never read can read uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, please. May I? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so here we know that these are very familiar passages and we know that these uh, two uh, verses uh, here are talking about the incarnation. They're foretelling the birth of Jesus Christ. And these prophecies were uh, delivered 700 years prior to its fulfillment, and we see that it was fulfilled in uh, Jesus Christ, even as he is God, became God incarnate, God becoming man, okay? And we see that the virgin uh, gave birth to a son, and, um, uh, you know, that his name will be called Emmanuel, okay? And uh, we'll move on to the next prophecy, that uh, uh, the prophecy concerning that uh, the Messiah, uh, or the Christ that is to be born will come from Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Can somebody read Micah chapter 5, verse 2, please? Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, who is going forth and from of old from everlasting. Thank you. So we had uh, looked at this verse when we talked about um, uh, God and uh, his uh, nature of being everlasting, uh, from, from being from eternity to eternity, uh, and his going forth are from old. Uh, so we see, um, you know, the, this fulfillment of this prophecy that uh, Jesus, uh, you know, uh, came out of Judah. We read this in Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 6, when uh, Herod is looking for where this Christ child is to be born, he calls the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asks them where is this Messiah to be born, and they say in Bethlehem in Jude Judea, because this is what the prophets had written, and we see, uh, you know, the fulfillment of this uh, prophecy as well, okay? Then we look at... Uh, Another few more prophecies that Jesus will come riding on a donkey. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Can somebody read that, please? Zechariah 
Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king coming to you is he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. He caught the fools of a donkey. Amen. Okay, so here it's thank you. Um, uh, here we see that uh, the Messiah, the one who is promised um, uh, to save the people, will come riding on a donkey, uh, the colt of a donkey. And did this happen? Yes, no? Yes, no. Yes, how do we know it happened? How do we know that uh, Jesus rode on a colt of a donkey? A donkey's colt? Yes, we read in the scripture. Yes, Matthew. we read this in, yeah. Matthew? I don't know the scripture. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, Rosalind. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Uh, we see Jesus did enter Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, um, you know, and this uh, prophecy which was fulfilled, uh, was predicted or foretold 400 years before was fulfilled uh, when Jesus entered uh, Jerusalem just before his crucifixion on a donkey's colt, okay? The next uh, prophecy, the Old Testament prophecy regarding the incarnation of Jesus Christ is uh, the messenger of the covenant. Uh, we read this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Can somebody read Malachi chapter 3, verse 1? Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, his coming, says the Lord of hosts. Thank you. So here Jesus, uh, we see Jesus quoting Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. Um, now it says here, Behold, I send my messenger. Uh, who is this messenger? Who is this Jesus Christ. Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, if you look at this verse, I wanted to read it clear, uh, carefully. It says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Is it okay? Yes, thank you, Zihotori. It is John the Baptist, because here it says, Behold, I send my messenger. And if you look at my, it is a capital M, so it's referring to God. And says, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Okay. Yeah, yeah no problem, Rosalind. Uh, can you please mute your mic? Yeah, thank you, Rosalind. Yeah, so here we see that, um, you know, and he will prepare the way. So he is referring to the messenger. And if you look at it, it's not a capital H. Uh, it's not a capital H. So it's not referring to God or Jesus Christ. It's a small H. So we know the messenger is, um, you know, a messenger will come and prepare the way before me. And if you look at the me there, it's a capital M. Okay. So if you want to really know if it is uh, referring to uh, God or to Jesus Christ, then look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the words, whether if it's in a capital letter, then it's referring always to um, uh, God or to Jesus Christ and if it's a small letter then it's referring to uh, you know human uh, being okay so here I before I behold I send my messenger and he which is small h will prepare the way before me which is a capital M so God is saying you know um, that um, uh, the, the messenger will come before uh, Jesus Christ and he will prepare a way for Jesus. And this messenger here is referring to John the Baptist who will prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Uh, we read uh, about this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. 
uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 76 uh, and John chapter 1 verse uh, 23. Okay. Um, we also see that uh, it is said that the Lord would suddenly come to his temple. So here it says, um, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come. Now we're looking at the latter half of uh, this, uh, this um, covenant uh, regarding uh, the Old Testament prophecy regarding Jesus Christ. So the first half we saw was the messengers, John the Baptist, he'll come before Jesus. This latter half of this verse says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And it's talking about his temple, which is a capital H. So it's talking about God's temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. And if you look at this messenger here, it's a capital M. But if you look at the messenger that is there in the first uh, phrase of this sentence, is it a capital M or a small m? In the first uh, part of this verse. Is this capital M? Or? Yes, it's a small m, right? If you look at, behold, I send my messenger. Yeah, it's a small m. So when it's talking about a small m, it's referring to a human being. But if you look at um, towards the end of this verse, uh, verse one, it says, even the messenger of the covenant, and there is a capital M, which is referring to Jesus Christ. And here it's saying in the second half of this prophecy that uh, uh, this messenger, who is Jesus Christ, will suddenly come uh, to the temple. And we see it fulfilled uh, when Jesus came. Uh, and we read about this in John chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, when Jesus came and cleansed the temple from those who were selling cattle, sheep, and um, doves. And it says, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Okay, so we see that Jesus is referred to as a messenger of the covenant here. Uh, why are we saying that this messenger that is referred to here in the latter part of this verse is Jesus? Because the capital M and he's the one who initiated the covenant, uh, the new covenant between God and man. And uh, in the first half of this, the first phrase of this uh, verse, we see it's a small m and it's referring to before the coming of uh, Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is referred to as the messenger of the covenant. Uh, we see Jesus himself saying this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He says, I have come to fulfill the old covenant. I have not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. So he says, I've come to fulfill the covenant. And in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 16 to 13, uh, we see, uh, uh, you know, Jesus spoken of as a mediator of the new covenant. That means he ushered in the new covenant. How did he usher in the new covenant? When he died on the cross, he uh, reconciled man to God. And thus he brought about peace and reconciliation. And thus he un initiated the new covenant, which is no longer by the law, but it is by grace through faith. Okay. So... Uh, he is Jesus Christ is the initiator of the new covenant. Did you understand this verse? Any doubts? We see all of it, what was fulfilled, uh, was written and predicted here in this prophecy was fulfilled in terms of John the Baptist coming, making a way for Jesus, in terms of Jesus cleansing the temple, and in terms of Jesus, uh, you know, being the mediator or initiating the new covenant. Okay. There's no questions. We will move on to the next uh, prophecy, Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1, uh, verse 6, and verse 7. So can somebody who's not read for a long time, can you please read Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1, 6, and 7, please? I I'm, uh, I'm reading. Yeah, go ahead. No. Behold my servant whom I, I up, uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. 
I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Thank you. Um, so here we see that, um, you know, uh, behold my servant. So my is a capital, God is saying my. And if you look at this S, it's a capital S. So, uh, you know, it's talking about uh, Jesus Christ. Now, Isaiah um, prophesy in, in, the, in the book of Isaiah, there are four uh, servant songs. Okay, chapters that are called as servant songs. Servant is referring to uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, um, uh, and he says, "Upon whom, uh, upon the servant, uh, God has put His uh, spirit." We read about this in Isaiah chapter six, verses uh, sixty-one, verses one and three. Luke chapter four, verses eighteen and uh, nineteen, that the spirit of the Lord was upon uh, Jesus. Okay, so we look at some important facts about the servant who is referred to as Jesus Christ. Uh, the servant was um, to be given as a covenant to the people, and it refers to the new covenant that Jesus came to give us. Um, but if you notice here that the servant himself was to be given as a covenant, that means Jesus himself was presented or given as a covenant. It says, I will give you as a covenant to the people. That means Jesus made uh, the perfect sacrifice. And by making that perfect sacrifice, he initiated the covenant. He brought about that covenant. Um, so he was um, uh, given as a covenant to the people. And scripture also teaches us that uh, Jesus is the one who established the new covenant. Uh, he is the priest who officiated uh, you know, the covenant by sprinkling of the blood. Uh, we know that, you know, any covenant, the, any sacrifice that is made is made by the priest and it's done by the sprinkling of the blood on the altar or on the, you know, on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so Jesus is a priest who officiated the new covenant and how did he do it? By shedding his own blood. We read about this in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15 and Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 15. Now, I'm just quoting these verses. All of them are in your course content. We don't have the time to go through everything. The important, most of the important passages will be going through, but I will request you to take time and read it, okay? And Jesus is also the one who, um, you know, brought about the covenant into effect. Uh, he's the one who died on the cross and through his death, he made the full sufficient and perfect sacrifice uh, that, uh, that, you know, brought about the new covenant that made the new covenant effective because it uh, was the perfect sacrifice that was needed for uh, the covenant to be made. And we see that he himself is the covenant. Jesus is a new covenant and he embodies, the, the Messiah embodies the uh, covenant of God. Now, uh, why are we saying that Jesus is the uh, made, you know, was the, uh, uh, by through his sacrifice, he made the new covenant because, you know, every covenant that Jesus, uh, God made in the Old Testament, we see it's through a sacrifice, it's through an animal that was cut, the blood that was shed. Uh, in those days, uh, in the Old Testament times, when they made a covenant between two people, uh, they usually used to cut off their, uh, you know, their palm or their wrist here, and both the parties used to, you know, uh, mingle their hands like this, uh, you know, touch the part where uh, they made the cut, where the blood was, uh, uh, you know, uh, oozing out. Uh, and they're saying that, you know, the covenant that they make is life for life. Okay. Uh, so here also we see that, uh, you know, uh, when God makes a covenant in the Old Testament, there's always a sacrifice, whether it's Noah, you know, Noah made the sacrifice, Abraham, uh, you know, he cut the animals and then, you know, God passed, the, uh, brought the fire and passed through the uh, those animals and it was all burnt on the altar. So we see all of them had a sacrifice where there was blood. That means blood for blood. That means life for life. So if I don't keep this covenant, then you know, you're, you are uh, uh, authorized to take my life. So we see that, you know, 
by Jesus giving his life, by shedding his blood, he brings into uh, effect the new covenant. He initiates the new covenant. He establishes the new covenant. And he himself is the covenant because he embodies the uh, new covenant. The new covenant is, uh, is, is, uh, is in him and he manifests the new covenant. He embodies the new uh, covenant. The second thing that we, important fact that we can learn from this verse is um, in Isaiah chapter 42 verses 1, 6 and 7, it says as a servant was to open the blind eyes, bring the prisoners out and um, those who sit in darkness out of the prison house and we see that uh, this is uh, uh, fulfilled uh, we read about this in Luke in uh, in Matthew chapter 4 verses 12 and 16 uh, we also read it in Luke chapter 4 verse 17 and 18 in Luke chapter 4 verse 17 and 18 Jesus said the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free and uh, we see that you know uh, Jesus came to do this he established this he set the prisoners free and we see that this is being continued even today uh, you know, even as uh, uh, the Holy Spirit sets people free out of their uh, chains, their, their uh, enslavement to Satan, to sin, uh, you know, uh, open the blind eyes of those who are blinded uh, by the truth of the gospel and lets them see the, um, uh, the light that is in gospel and he brings them out of darkness. So Jesus did this when he lived here on the earth and we see this happening even today. Now the third important fact or truth that we learn from this prophecy is the servant will bring forth justice to the uh, Gentiles. Uh, we see that the ministry of the servant, the servant here I said is Jesus Christ, uh, was not just restricted to his own race, that is the Jewish people. Uh, we see Jesus also ministering to the Gentiles. Um, you know, to um, those who were non-Jews. And he brings, we see that he brought justice and righteousness uh, to them, even when he died on the cross and even when he ministered uh, uh, to them. And this task is also being assigned to us as the body of Christ. Okay, we are uh, to bring forth uh, justice to the Gentiles. And how do we bring justice to the Gentiles? How do we bring righteousness to the Gentiles? Is, uh, you know, when we fulfill the task that Christ has given to us, when we share the good news, um, when we set people free from their uh, darkness into bring them into the light of the gospel of the truth that is in Jesus Christ, uh, we break the chains and bondages um, uh, and we set them free. Uh, we are also doing what Christ did of bringing uh, justice to the uh, Gentiles, okay? And this we see in Acts chapter 13, verses 46 to uh, 48. Can somebody read that, please? Acts chapter 3, verses 46 to 48. Acts 13, 46 to 48. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of god should be spoken to you first but since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life behold we turn to the gentiles for so the lord has commanded us i have said you as a light to the gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth and now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Okay, thank you. So here we see Paul and Barnabas um, boldly saying that, uh, you know, uh, they brought the word of the Lord, the good news. Uh, uh, it was spoken to the Jews first, but since they rejected it, um, and, um, uh, you know, they, they, the Paul and Barnabas uh, and their team, you know, turned towards the Gentiles. And why did they bring the good news of salvation of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles? Because, not because the Jews rejected it. It's not just because, um, you know, they didn't have any other audience uh, because the Jews refused to listen to them. 
Uh, so they go to, you know, the Gentiles, but it says it was because the Lord had commanded us. It was a command of the Lord. It's not just something that they felt or they wanted to do. Uh, and what did the Lord command Paul and Barnabas? He said, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay, so Paul is saying, yes, we brought the message to you Jews, but you refused. So we took it to the Gentiles, uh, not in retaliation, not because to show you down or, uh, you know, uh, because we needed an audience as well, but because it was a command of the Lord. And when the Gentiles heard the good news of the salvation, their response was totally different. They were very glad and they glorified uh, God. So just as God had commanded and, you know, prophesied that uh, the, the, the servant who is to come, that is Jesus Christ, uh, will set the captives free, will bring light to the Gentiles. Um, we too are to follow this command just as Paul and Barnabas received it. We too are given this command as, um, uh, you know, people of the new covenant, people of the church, uh, the body of Christ, that we need to take the light of the gospel to the nations of the world uh, because the people need uh, the gospel, okay? So even as we looked at um, all of these Old Testament uh, prophecies concerning, uh, you know, the the incarnation of Christ, uh, the, the coming of Jesus uh, or God becoming man, it's not just for us to know, okay, these are the Old Testament prophecies that, uh, you know, uh, God gave and it is fulfilled and Jesus Christ came and he finished the work. But, um, you know, let it lead us into a deeper adoration of, uh, you know, um, of this infinite God, limitless God that we serve, who planned things even before the foundation of the world. And in his mind, everything was completed and done thing that Christ was died on the cross and is crucified. Uh, you know, let us just stand in worship and awe and adoration and give him all the glory for his, um, for who he is, what he has done. And also let's just, uh, you know, thank Jesus for his work, uh, uh, for coming and uh, fulfilling and initiating the new covenant. You know, we are privileged people compared to the people of the Old Testament because we are part of the new covenant. Uh, we no longer under the law, but under grace. And it's uh, by grace and through faith that we are saved. And it's not just by keeping the law. And uh, we have so much of the grace of God, the love of God that is just poured out into our hearts. So even as we study all of these Old Testament prophecies, let us uh, you know about concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Let us just let it lead us into, you know, just worshiping God, adoring him, thanking him for his plan, for redeeming mankind uh, from our sins, uh, for his salvation and um you know, knowing that we are in the end days, okay? We looked at the prophecy that's talking about um, Shiloh and the coming and gathering of the people uh, where, you know, Jesus is going to come soon and he's going to gather people from all nations and those who do not know him, first of all, are not going to receive the blessings, okay? They're already not receiving the blessing. Secondly, they will not be part of the millennium rule. And thirdly, they will be destined to eternal hell. So that should lead us into a greater uh, awareness and a deeper burden, uh, you know, uh, that people are lost. The coming of Jesus is soon, that we need to share the good news uh, with family who do not know, uh, relatives who do not know him, uh, neighbors, so that people are saved. They can enjoy the blessings, the covenantal blessings that God had given uh, through his seed, that is Abraham's seed, that is Jesus Christ. Through him all nations shall be blessed. And also that, you know, when God comes again, when he gathers everybody, uh, they all people will be gathered and none will be left behind. Okay. So let's, even as we study all of this, consider, ponder, let's just uh, burst forth into worship, adoration, thanksgiving. And also um, let's not just be complacent and thank God that we are saved. We enjoy the blessings, but it's not uh, just a privilege, but it's a responsibility that we have. And like Jesus fulfilled his responsibility, he also sets us a standard that we need to fulfill our responsibility. Okay, that's the end of chapter four. 
Uh, so anyone has any questions on the prophecies concerning the incarnation of Christ? No questions? If there's no question, then it's, it's a little scary, you know, because uh, uh, wondering whether you've understood everything, it's clear. Or there are still some doubts, and that's why, you know, there are kind of no questions. Okay, I'll request you to please go through your notes. You have one week before we meet next Monday, and it's a long gap, Monday to Monday. So I request you to please go through your notes even before you come to your next class um, so that uh, you are able to understand, and if you have any doubts, you can clear that, okay? Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Uh, have a good day and God bless all of you and I'll see you uh, soon. I'll see you next tomorrow for our doctoral foundations class. Not tomorrow, Wednesday. Okay, yeah. Thank you everyone. See you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, you ma'am.